Does, does anybody ever begin one of these conversations with you by not saying it's an honor to be here with you? No, very few, so okay. please don't, don't say it. Well, okay, I won't, I won't. And who are our friends here? Well, um, I'm going to introduce them at the point in our conversation when it's relevant, but this is Cow. <laughs> this is Mr. H, and this is Ratty. Okay. And at yeah. the appropriate points as we talk, okay. I hope there'll be an opportunity to tell you why they're sitting here. Okay. And also, me guy, you Jane. <laughs> 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 All right. All right. Um, I've read your... uh, Tarzan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've read the books. I've watched the film, Jane. And one thing that struck me was that apparently Dr. Leakey didn't want a so-called trained biologist. So when you first met him and began this saga, what were your qualifications? Zero. Absolutely zero? <laughs> Except that I was born loving animals when I was a child. I just watched animals, and there weren't so many where I grew up in England. You know, there were worms and snails, there were all kinds of birds, and occasionally there was a fox, and I watched them as much as I could. And uh, I, I did well at school, and we didn't have money for university, so I had to do a secretarial and got a job in London. And how that ended up for me studying chimps, maybe that comes later. But <laughs> All right. You know, at the time that you began studying the chimps, scientists were not supposed to name them, not supposed to attribute human qualities to them, attribute tool-making capabilities, attribute empathy, and yet you did all these things. So what's the lesson there about defying Wisdom, define convention, define what's right. Well, I think uh, to answer that question, I sort of have to go back a bit and um, say that when I eventually saved up money to get to Africa to follow my childhood dream, which actually began when I read Tarzan of the Apes. <laughs> That's why I said Tarzan. And fell in love with him and was very jealous because he married the wrong Jane. <laughs> right? Could you agree? <laughs> and that's when my dream began. I will go to Africa, I will live with animals, I will write books about them. And everybody laughed at me. But I was incredibly lucky in having an incredibly supportive mother who said, if you really want this thing, you're going to have to work really hard, take advantage of all opportunities, and never give up. So, left school, no money for university, did a boring, awful secretarial course. Uh, opportunity when a school friend invited me to Africa. And to get the money, I had to leave my job in London where you couldn't save, go home uh, to Bournemouth and work as a waitress, which is very hard work, by the way. Have you ever been a waiter? No. 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 Oh, well, if you had, you would know it's really hard work. Anyway, I eventually got the fare, got to Africa, heard about Louis Leakey, and he offered me this opportunity to go and study the chimps. And now we can get on to your question. <laughs> At first, the chimps ran away from me. They'd never seen a white ape before. <laughs> and you are an ape. I'm not sure if you're white. I'm a white ape. Um, there's some people out here who have different colored skin, but we're all the fifth grade ape. That's what we biologically are. But they'd never seen a white one, and so they ran away. And um, <laughs> eventually they got used to me and I was able to observe them. And I observed this chimpanzee reaching out, picking stems of grass, using them to fish termites from their nests, pick them off. Um, and I observed him picking a leafy twig and stripping off the leaves in other words, he was using tools, he was making tools. And at that time, it was supposed to be, according to science, only humans that used and made tools. So, uh, Louis Leakey, my sponsor, uh, was extremely excited. That enabled him to ask the National Geographic to step in to fund the future research. 
And he, they not only agreed to do that, but they sent a photographer and filmmaker, Hugo van Lauwek, to record what I was observing about the chimps. So I was learning more and more about the chimps as they became used to me. And then Louis Leakey said, you have to get a degree. You can't get money when I'm dead if you don't have a degree. Um, but he said, we haven't got time to mess with the BA. I found, you, <laughs> I found you a way of going to Cambridge University in England to do a PhD in ethology. And I didn't know what ethology meant. But you, you skipped the bachelor's and master's and went straight to yes, PhD? Yes, yes. <laughs> I was, <laughs> it, it was nothing to do with me, guys. Nothing to do with me. It was leaky. And um, it was a huge responsibility for me. And so I'd been two years with the chimps and I got to Cambridge. And imagine how I felt when I was told by these erudite professors, you've done everything wrong. You shouldn't have given the chimps names. It's not scientific. They should have had numbers. You can't talk about their personalities or their minds capable of thought or their emotions. I was scared of those professors, but fortunately, when I was a child, I had an amazing teacher who taught me that wise though these professors may have been in their learning in this respect, they were wrong. You know who that teacher was? Oh. My dog. <laughs> Your dog? Rusty. You, I'm sure out there in the audience, you understand we can't share our lives with a dog, a cat, a, a rat, a, a rabbit, a horse, a pig, a bird, whatever, and not know the professors were wrong. Of course, we are not the only beings with personalities, minds, and emotions. And so I stuck to my conviction, and eventually the professors came around, and I truly believe, I, I honestly believe, that we have to thank the chimps a lot because it, it now turns out they're so like us biologically so that we differ from them in the composition of DNA by only just over 1%. Mm -hmm. And the similarities in the immune system, the composition of the blood, the anatomy of the brain, that combined with Hugo's film of their postures and gestures of communication, kissing, embracing, holding hands, patting one another, um, oh swaggering, shaking their fists, throwing rocks, using tools. They had to believe that we are not the only beings with personalities, minds, and emotions. Cool. So that's how it happened. Okay. I, I, Thanks to my dog. I, I, you're killing me, Jane. Um, Why am I killing you? You're killing me because yesterday, my daughter brings home a puppy. And I said, we are not keeping that dog. And now, she's grinning ear to ear right here. <laughs> I can anticipate this conversation. Well, Dr. Goodall said, you can learn so much from a dog, we should keep him. <laughs> would, you, would you like to share custody with me? <laughs> um, well, I could provide some parental support, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, your dog biscuit. Okay, thank you. I appreciate your concern. Uh, <laughs> there are many young people in the audience and who are watching this. So, in today's setting, where everybody you know believes they have to get this undergraduate education and they have to go and get a PhD and all that, what's your take on the the necessity of formal education today for a young person? It depends on what the young person wants to do. And what, what upsets me is that there's this, you know, if you don't get a degree of some sort in some kind of college or university, you're useless. And that's rubbish. I mean, you, you can... You can <laughs> thank you. It, it really depends on what the young person wants to do. Um, the problem is in science that it's very difficult to get a job if you don't have a degree. So that, you know, even Louis Leakey told me I would have to eventually get a degree. So I would urge young people who want to, want to become scientists. I didn't want to become a scientist because when I was growing up, it was an awful long time ago, uh, women didn't become scientists. Now they do. 
So women now who want to become scientists will probably need to get a degree. If they just want to work with animals and help animals, they don't need a degree. And the main thing is for a young person to know exactly what they want to do, to be really determined in what they want to do. And then my mother used to say to me, when I had this crazy dream, if you really want this, you're going to have to work extremely hard, take advantage of all opportunities, but don't give up. So, so that's my advice to young people today. It sounds like your mom was the original tiger mom. <laughs> she was utterly amazing. And if, if I hadn't had that kind of mother, I might have not have done what I've done. I mean, I don't know, but okay. she supported my dream. She didn't get mad when I took earthworms to bed when I was one and a half. <laughs> Bring and, puppies home. <laughs> and, uh, no, I didn't find puppies, but I found mice and injured animals, and she never got mad at me. Okay. Uh, you said in the movie that you, when you were young, you had dreams, and in those dreams, you were a man. Mm. Can you explain that? And is that still necessary in today's world? No, I don't think it is. But when I was young, you know, girls were supposed to, well, they got the, 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 the sort of thing in the UK is you got married, you looked after your children, you were a good wife, you cooked for your husband, um, and you didn't become a scientist. You might become a secretary or a nurse or perhaps uh, you might become a missionary's wife. And so those were the expectations for women. And I remember that uh, I went to Buckingham Palace and for some bizarre reason, I was proposed by somebody to get a, uh, a DBE, a Dame of the British Empire. And all these women were you, there. You went to Buckingham to Palace? To, yes, to get this degree. And okay. They, they all, <laughs> yeah, well, Anyway, they said to me, <laughs> I, I heard them talking, and they said to me, don't you want to be, um, uh, you know, working in Buckingham Palace? Don't you want to be a maid of honor to the queen? Don't you want to be all these? And I said, no, I want to go to Africa and live with wild animals. And they looked, and they kind of shunned me, like they went <laughs> over there. And I was left on my own. So I was considered to be peculiar, but I had a mother who, believed in me and supported me. And look what's happened. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So we've, we've already touched a lot about your mother and motherhood. I also found it very interesting that when you had your son, didn't you essentially pause your career? Yeah. And what are your hindsights on that? Was that the right thing to do? Was it... Uh, no, oh, I, I believe, you know, I get, I get very upset when women who can, some women can't, some women have to continue with their careers to bring in the money to survive. But some women, uh, maybe their husband brings in a lot of money, like, like you. <laughs> <laughs> right? well, From your mouth to God's ears, right? Jane. <laughs> um, and if they decide they want to take time off and be a mother, and people say, well, that's, you know, that's like going back to the, to the old days and tying yourself with your apron strings to the kitchen. It's incredibly important, if you can, to spend time with your young child and be there for them and be supportive. So it's, 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 it's a job, and it's a very hard job, but I think it's tremendously important. On the other hand, there are some women who aren't cut out to be good mothers. They just don't want to be good mothers. So then the answer is to try and find an alternative. So I truly believe for a human child, it doesn't have to be the biological mother, but that child needs, needs to feel secure, needs to feel wanted, needs to feel there is at least one and preferably two or three adults who are there to support that child. Um. I've read your theories of the stages of life. Would you explain those stages and tell people about the stage you're currently in? My stages of life? You mean like Shakespeare? 
Yeah. The, <laughs> no, like, like well, in your the book. The five agents of man. <laughs> okay. Well, the stage I'm in now is my last stage. I don't suppose there'll be many more stages. Um, you know, I'm nearly 85. And when you get to 85, you know you're closer to wherever the end is. Might be here, there, or there, but you're closer than you were when you were born. And the stage I'm in now is a stage of, of, of increasing my activity because I've got less time to get out a message, which is an incredibly important message. And so I have to work harder and longer hours and travel 300 days a year, which I hate, and spread a message of awareness because we're running out of time. And what I've learned from the chimpanzees is the way, not only the ways we're similar to them, but the ways that we're different. And to me, the key difference is the, the explosive development of our intellect. So the chimpanzees are way more intelligent than we used to think. But so are so many other animals. We're learning that, you know, we're not so different, and yet, in this respect, we are, because we've designed, for example, well, I, th I guess you could talk about Apple computers, if you would, but I'm going to talk about that rocket that went up to Mars, and a little robot crawled off and took photos of the surface of Mars. Mm -hmm. The planet that we once thought maybe had some kind of life, but you look at those photos, I'm sure you have, you don't want to go and live there, do you? No. So here we are, this most intellectual species to ever walk the planet, and yet we're destroying our only home. How come? Is it because there's a disconnect between this clever brain and the human heart, which is love and compassion? What do you think? Well, the, the lesson that I drew from the movie and the book was when that four-year war took place. So it, it seems like you know, in the DNA, there's this inherent tribalism and violence, and I think we're seeing that now. So I was going to ask you about that. So, you know, I had no idea that that war happened until I you know, did the research for this presentation. And I always thought it was, you know, kumbaya among the chimps, and such is not the case. So can you explain that uh, and the ramifications upon society? Yeah, well, the reason Louis Leakey sent me to study the chimps was because, you know, he was searching for the fossils of early man. Mm -hmm. And from the fossils, you can tell a lot about what the creature looked like and what it had from its tooth, oops, tooth wear and things, but you can't tell about the behavior. So he, knowing that the great apes are our closest living relatives, thought, well, if Jane finds behavior that's similar or even the same between chimpanzees today and humans today, maybe that behavior was in a common ape-like, human-like ancestor about six million years ago, and maybe, just maybe, that behavior has come with the human uh, line and the ape line, uh, and that would help him, he said, to understand a little bit better or to imagine how early humans might have behaved. So I think he was right, and I think that we've had a great insight into how our earliest ancestors behave because of the information about chimps. Um, but, uh, you know, aggression? Do we have inherent aggressive tendencies? I think so. That was a political issue in the early 70s. And when I talked about the fact that chimps had the equivalent of a primitive warfare, that I should suppress that and not talk about it, because that might imply that humans had innate aggressive tendencies. And there was a whole movement then, I don't know if you remember it, but that we were human babies were born with a clean slate, and all aggression was learned. And I couldn't believe that. I could not believe that. Anyway, I did talk about it. But, the, okay, so we do have, I think, innate aggressive tendencies, but we have this superior brain, 
we are capable, if we so wish, of suppressing those aggressive tendencies. But unfortunately, aggressive tendencies that become political, they're different. That is not the primitive chimpanzee aggression where you fight members of a neighboring community over territory. This is something different. It's all tied in with our materialistic lifestyle today. And politics gets so far away from who we really are, doesn't it? From the bottom of my heart, and I'm sure everyone here, it was an honor for us to be here. And we have learned so much. So we all want to thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.